Take it away, Brian, all yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, good day. My name is Brian Bouters, um, and I'm here to talk to you about operating Pulp as a service one year later. Um, we, uh, so I'm the team lead for a small group of people um, that operate Pulp as a service at Red Hat. And um, uh, prior to that, I was a developer, like an everyday developer on the project, been with the Pulp project for about 10 years. And it's been really interesting to go from uh, my main focus being kind of developing the code to operating that code. So uh, let's tell you all about it. Let me see if I can operate these slides. Yeah, so today we're gonna um, go over these, these things. Please do unmute and ask questions or put it into the chat, which I can see here as well. Uh, if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can put questions down below. And we'll see those as well. Um, we're gonna go over our deployment and I'm gonna tell you all about it. We're gonna go over our team and um, you know, that's such an important, such an important part. Um, so we're gonna go over who is on this team. And we're, I'm gonna talk over um, how we compose and build and deploy. Uh, we're gonna talk about how our upgrades work, some scale testing that we did. We'll call it some pain points that we've run into. Uh, we had one outage, I'll tell you about that. Um, and some wins that have been pretty great. Um, we're gonna come back to the team a little bit later, but the first thing I want to tell you is it's a great team of folks who help operate this. And a lot of the work that you see here is um, overwhelmingly theirs and, and not mine. So I'm really proud to present the work of, of a bunch of folks um, who you'll hear about specifically in a little bit. Um, our deployment overview. So about 18 months ago, two to three Pulp developers uh, were tasked with operating Pulp, a Pulp installation full time. So this is a hosted installation. Our installation runs on console.redhat.com and it's used in a bunch of different ways by Red Hat. I'm not gonna get into the kind of the business side of it because um, it's kind of an operational focus here. Um, but I do wanna tell you it runs in OpenShift on, in US East. We don't use any sort of, um, we don't use any sort of CDN right now. Um, we haven't really needed to, even though at times we deliver content pretty far, like we've, we have a bunch of client testing that's happened like as far as Singapore and Australia and East Asia. So that's pretty far from US East, but it, it hasn't really been an issue um, in terms of needing a global CDN. Um, I suspect we will at some point, but it just hasn't been something that's come up. Um, the feedback we've gotten from all the performance testing we've done globally has been, yeah, it works pretty well. Uh, we have three environments. There's the, the ephemeral environment, the staging, and the production environment. Uh, these are things that were primarily here for us already, um, it, entirely, actually. Uh, so console to redhat.com defines these three kinds of environments. And um, the idea is, you know, your stuff lands in ephemeral first, which are um, specific deployments that are set up and short-lived, like your whole service, like Pulp, is set up and then torn down, like, you know, four hours later or something like that. Staging is is a long lived deployment where stuff goes before it then goes into production, which is a, its own separate deployment. So each of these has like a full pulp setup. Uh, the database is backed by RDS in all of these instances, or maybe just state certainly in staging and production. Ephemeral, I don't think is actually RDS, um, but uh, ephemeral short lived. Correct. Yeah, ephemeral short lived. It's it's not really that important. So. For staging and production, we use the um, RDS service, which is the Postgres service that AWS runs. I don't know what RDS stands for. Um, it's uh, it's Postgres as a service run by AWS. Um, so there's two. There's one for staging and there's one for production. Our storage is S3, and we have a lot of buckets because we have heavy domain use, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, so that S3, like I mentioned with storage, is all in US East. Um, that's where the region that those those buckets live in. We use Redis for application caching. Um, it's important to making our installation snappy in terms of serving large amounts of content. Um, and, and we use that feature. So our production instance size has changed has changed um, month by month as like for different reasons. We kind of scaled it down a little bit recently while we were doing some open telemetry testing. Um, 
So this is what it is today. Um, we have 10 pulp-content pods to serve content. Each of those has one Goonicorn process each. We've had 10 for a while, um, but we recently, or prior to the most recent change, we had, I think, also like 10 Goonicorn processes. So we, the knob we really turned here was the number of Goonicorn processes. And it has to do with a lot of technical things with our open telemetry data overriding each other. Deco was talking some about that in the previous session. So um, it's kind of neither here nor there. Um, this is the state of the deployment size today. Each of these pods runs um, half of a CPU and one gig of RAM. And they run on this uh, M5 2X large box, which um, the only thing to call out here is that when we say, it's like, well, it's half a CPU of what? Well, it's an Intel, Intel Xeon Platinum 8175, um, if that means anything to you. So uh, it's, it's a pretty small footprint, I would say, for the content serving. Um, the API pods, uh, on the other hand, are a little bit bigger. So there's 10 of those. Um, there's one Goonicorn process each there as well for the same open telemetry metrics. And similarly, previously, this number was also a lot higher. So we had a lot more API capacity before, but because of the open telemetry testing, this is what it is right now. And we have two CPUs and four gigs of RAM. So our API process is definitely more RAM intensive. Um, and it runs on the same kind of a box. And then we have 24 workers. So our, our task capacity is pretty, um, pretty big. Uh, we at times have had them as large as like 50, um, you know, 48 workers, I think was our max at one point. And then we've dropped them back to 24. Um, the workers, even when they're idle, still do generate some load. And so um, we didn't just want to have a huge number of workers. Like you can't just add more workers and add workers and add workers. Like the pulp application can't go forever in that sense. So um, 24 has been great for us. Um, it definitely serves all of our needs. Um, 48, I think, also worked pretty well. I wouldn't go higher than 100, I would say. And on the application side, we could probably do better um, to improve Pulp's ability to have more workers um, without loading up the database with SQL queries at, at while the application is just idling, which is kind of what we ran into. Um, so we use 24 workers with two CPUs and a 5 gig RAM limit. 5 gig is what allows us to do kind of RPM syncing from all the repos that we want to sync from, like Apple or RHEL, um, Fedora, other third-party repos without having any out-of-memory issues. We had out-of-memory issues when our RAM limit was 4 gigs, and we made it 5 gigs, and we haven't had any issues since. Um, the RPM team has also been kind of delivering a series of, of nice performance memory, memory performance improvements. So big thanks to them for helping us fit inside this footprint. The RDS instance is... Uh, is a big database. So it's eight vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. Um, we did some scale testing, which is how we arrived at this being the right fit for us. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, our Redis is small. So Redis just stores um, key value pairs for caching purposes and memory. So um, it's just one gig of RAM roughly. Uh, and it, it doesn't really store a large amount of data, um, but it's important that we can access it fast. Um, so the Redis is kind of just a small thing that's there. Uh, plugin wise, so we use these plugins, um, RPM, Python, OS tree, and gem. Of these, RPM is overwhelmingly the, the usage dominant uh, plugin. So, I mean, I'd say like 99% to one relative to the other ones. Um, the other content types are kind of still being integrated against and they're not all yet in production in terms of their usage. Like they're in production for our service, but in terms of code of other services and products that build on top of them, those aren't yet in production. So um, we're very much an RPM installation at this point. Uh, we also use this thing called pulp uh, underscore service, which is a repository that's publicly available, but it's not released on PyPy. And that's a place for us to put different kinds of code that um, just doesn't make any sense in the upstream. Um, like there's a content guard, for instance, that we're working on. And that content guard is extremely specific to like another service at Red Hat. It just doesn't make any sense to release it. Um, it's public, um, but it's just not a plugin that anyone else would, 
we believe would find useful. If there ever was something that's useful in there, we would immediately move it to pulp core, for example. Um, so we use domains a lot. Uh, we have, as of this morning, 447 domains. Um, we also use our authorization model is not the authorization one that ships with pulp core. So with pulp core, by default, you get this um, database driven object level role based access control authorization, um, which is uh, which is great um, for us. It was challenging for us to get those permissions correct for so many different types of plugins and so many different users that we have. So we wanted a simpler model. And so we have this thing called domain authorization, which is one of the things that lives in this pulp service um, repo here. And so domain author authorization is real simple to understand. It means um, if you have, if you're authorized for a particular domain, um, you can do everything inside of that domain. There's no deeper granularity than that. Either you have access to it and you can do all the things or you don't. Um, and so that's been, and you also get the domain permission uh, access when you create a domain. So it's really nice kind of for self-service for us. Um, if that was useful for other folks, we could definitely look at making that available. So let us know if that is. Um, for authentication, we we have gateways that sit in front of the pulp application. Um, I could uh, tell you about a uh, like an architectural diagram, but I mean the important thing is uh, just for the sake of time is um, in front of pulp there are these gateways. Um, this is a gateway like the console.redhat.com gateway, and there's a few other host names as well that provide ingress from different network points of presence, um, like behind the VPN and off the VPN and different different entry points. Um, and you authenticate mostly at those gateways. And so by the time um, by the time the traffic shows up at our application, we don't do additional authentication. Um, it comes with these trusted headers that we um, that we have some some kind of custom middleware that looks at these headers and can recognize users that have already been authenticated in front of us. And then we do the authorization inside of our application. So we defer authentication and we handle authorization. Um, we also do support basic auth, but that's only for another application that's within the same US East cluster, which runs on top of OpenShift. Um, and we can't use basic auth in any other situation unless the traffic starts from that cluster because um, all the network routing that routes into the cluster from outside of it, um, the cluster being the um, OpenShift area where our application is, um, anytime that that traffic comes in, it drops all headers along with it. So we, we do use basic auth just for other applications that are within the same cluster. We use Django admin. Um, so we have that enabled on ours and we have a couple of models that are custom for us, primarily around the, the domain authorization stuff um, that we go into Django admin as administrators and, and kind of touch up the data now and then um, in terms of making sure like the right users have access to the right domains. Um, so we use Django admin. It's been really great for us, um, even though that's not enabled by default on our upstream project, um, but it's been really, really useful for us. So let's get into the people. Um, so initially, the team was just two people. Um, it was myself and Deco, who you just heard talk wonderfully about our metrics. Um, later, we added two more, which is Mike DiPaolo and Dennis Kleben. Um, and then we added some temporary capacity because we just had a really large amount of different usages that were interested in this installation. And we had a lot of ground to cover relatively quickly. So um, we ended up. Um, Thankfully, having Lubash temporarily join our team. Mike and Lubash um, then went on to take other roles. Um, and uh, you know, Mike transitioned, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago, and Lubash will transition here in, in a few weeks. And so we're kind of back down to, to three people. So it's myself, um, Deco, and, and Dennis. And we hope to, hope to add more in the future. But um, that's what it's taken for us to operate ours. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not that Pulp needs a lot of people to operate. Like, it has been pretty darn easy. Um, what we mostly spend our time on is all the stuff that's around Pulp, like 
getting it hooked up to the authentication systems with the gateways and and adding custom code for the header interpretation and getting these metrics working and getting our alerting working. And there's a long, long list of things that really have nothing to do with pulp code or its feature set. That is how we spend pretty much all of our time. So I'm telling you this because if you were listening to me and you're running your own pulp installation or you're planning to, you might, you might misunderstand, which is like, oh, well, this application takes three people. No, this application deployed in an enterprise environment probably takes three people. Um, but if you're just running it, like you just deploy it and you have a relatively straightforward installation that's self-contained, that doesn't touch a lot of outside gateways and outside authentication methods. Yeah, you could probably do this with one person, a little bit of time. And then once it's set up, you just don't touch it anymore, which I think is how most people run their pulp installations. Um, it's been an amazing team to work with. Each individual here, I'm very thankful to have had a lot of time with. And like I said, this work is primarily all theirs. And um, I want to say thank, uh, thanks to all of them for it. So here's how we compose. Um, this is this repo that I mentioned, the pulp service repo. So we, we in here have um, a variety of like different aspects of our compose. We're not really going to be going through the details here. Um, but the important part is that um, inside here uh, is what helps contain the references for what we're deploying um, along with an extra plugin like our own plugin that lets us put some custom code into it um so we build we only build on top of official pulp releases so we don't have any other code that that uh the public doesn't have basically um we don't release from branches we never build or or deploy from a branch um, we always deploy from code that is like a, a specific version that's available as a GitHub release. And that's great because it means that every time uh, all those assets that are available in GitHub, those versions of Pulp, whether it's a plugin or Pulp Core, have all gone through the full CI release process. So it gives us really high confidence. But it's also really great because Pulp releases pretty much weekly. And so um, there's not much delay in terms of like, oh, well, we added this but we want to make sure that it's part of a full release and that code is like fully released. So we don't have to wait that long because we release roughly every week and we occasionally request releases in between. It doesn't happen that often, but sometimes we do like maybe, maybe a few times in the past year. Um, we do carry patches. Um, sometimes uh, we typically only carry them for less than a week. Our goal is to not carry any patches. Um, we don't want our installation to deviate from the upstream code base. So we'll carry a patch and then evaluate that patch sometimes, or maybe we needed it really, really soon or sooner than the release. And so we'll, we'll patch our installation. But then as soon as we switch to that new release, um, we remove our patches. So we carry some patches and they're not around that long. Um, some code that I mentioned here is unique to our installation. I kind of already covered this, like this content guard. So those things live in this pulp service repo. Um, we originally built on Jenkins um, because, you know, when you run on OpenShift, your application is deployed as containers. So we build pulp um, into a container that's for us, which has all the versions that we want and the configurations that we need and all those things. Uh, the Jenkins building worked fine. Um, it did include some basic tests against the built container. Which, so we, we are testing after we make kind of our final asset, even before it's deployed. Those containers would get pushed to Quay.io. Um, later, we switched to a Red Hat internal build system. It's basically very similar in terms of our usage. It still does some basic tests. It still pushes a Quay.io. Um, they are about the same, in my opinion. So um, how we deploy. So we originally used the pulp operator. Um, and the pulp operator is really great for a lot of usages. It worked well for us. But the issue that we ran into was it, it really is focused on pulp. Um, and it doesn't do a lot for us in terms of everything that's around pulp. And that's that the theme here is like that's it's not pulp that's been challenging. It's actually getting pulp running with all these like enterprise expectations that are already here as part of, for instance, console.redhat.com. And so, you know, like there's the vault and there's the AWS buckets that need to be provisioned, and then the Redis, and then there's the, the database RDS instance, and there are monitoring configs, and there's collectors, and the list just goes on and on and on. Um and so what was happening was we 
we were using the operator to deploy our application, but then we ended up having to spend a whole bunch of work trying to like get that deployment integrated with all these other things. Um, so 12 months ago, roughly, we switched to using Clouder. Um, Clouder is a purpose-built um, operator for deploying on console.redhat.com. And so this is kind of like the inverse model of what we were doing with our pulp operator, where um, the pulp operator is really easy peasy to get pulp deployed, but it's harder if you needed to, to also have it manage like a whole bunch of other things. So with Clouder, um, it was real easy to have it manage all these other things. And then we had to teach it with our application config how to deploy pulp. But since it's all Kubernetes and OpenShift, it was actually pretty similar to the application definition inside of pulp operator. So this was a really good switch for us. Um, pulp operator is great if you are using, uh, if, if you know you have like an OpenShift or Kubernetes environment and you just want to deploy pulp onto it, it's really a great choice. If your enterprise environment already has a lot of tooling, maybe you should consider that. Um, I don't know, your mileage may vary. This has worked out really well for us. Yeah, I just want to add, <clears throat> add that we basically took the Kubernetes uh, resource definitions that are already in Pulp Operator, and we copied them over to our deployment. So we actually benefited a lot from what was already present in the Pulp Operator. Yeah, we benefited hugely. Um, yeah. Um, so we deploy to staging probably four to five times a day, and then we promote to production maybe once a week. So we deploy a lot. Like, it's really active. Um, we do online upgrades, um, zero downtime upgrades. Uh, Clouder allows us to do that. I think the operator did. I can't really remember the details of it, but Clouder definitely does. Um, and But most importantly, Pulp as an application is committed to online upgrades whenever possible. I believe historically, since that policy went into effect, I think maybe like eight-ish months ago, um, there haven't been any exceptions. Um, so our upgrade experience has been, I think, phenomenal. We've had very, very pro few problems. I think maybe even zero problems. Um, so the process is like Clouder watches for a new container on Quay.io. It runs some migrations if they're necessary um, while the old application is still deployed. The new application gets deployed side by side the old one. And then when the health checks say the new application is good to go, it switches traffic over to the new pods. And then eventually it deprovisions the old pods. Um, this upgrade process has been, I think, really rock solid, uh, which, is, which has been great. So we did some scale testing. Um, we loaded our staging environment up with a whole bunch of data from copper.fedora and for cloud.org, which we just call copper. Um, and they host like a whole bunch of RPM repositories. And um, we did it in an on-demand way. So it wasn't actual binary data that, that we needed to fill up because it's huge. It's like at least terabytes and terabytes, probably a lot of terabytes. Um, they have 166-ish thousand repos uh, RPM repos, four to five million RPMs. So since we did it on demand, we didn't store the binary data, but like our database got four to five million rows in it. So the impact on the database was equivalent to if you had done it um, with actually storing the binary data. Uh, we use this load testing tool here, and you too can use it um, if you want to have your pulp installation get loaded up with a zillion repos. Um, after loading it, we wanted to look at the content and the API latencies. And we also noticed that there was just a large you know, it's a huge database, basically. So we made the database bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we kind of adjusted it to the current database that we have, which is, um, it's not, not sliding for me here, but our current database, which is the DBM7G2X large. So that's eight vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. So that's a big DB. So we, we did that after doing this big scale testing. Um, and then uh, RDS shows us slow queries, which let us analyze things. We've found a couple of problems along the way here. I'm not going to get into the details. I think we've tried to fix all the significant ones. Um, but it's been cool to have the scale testing help drive our bug fixes. Um, after loading up the system, we wanted to look at um, publish times was actually for one of our stakeholders, which is Copper, um, who's looking at using our service. Uh, 
was making sure that their publish times are have reasonable latency. So we looked at publishing an RPM repository with like 270,000 packages and it took 842 seconds, which is long or not long, depending on how you feel about 270,000 packages. Um, the second largest one was 195 seconds, but on average, there's a large number of repos that have a very few number of packages and those happen in under two seconds. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick time check. That is my time. I have more content prepared. Um, can I continue and try to wrap it up? Uh, we've got UI coming next, and then there's the lightning talk section, which is kind of open. Uh, how much how much time do you need, Brian? Uh, I will wrap up on time. Um, let me okay. take three more minutes. Um, okay. So uh, pain points. Um, so if Clatter provisions the bucket, it puts those credentials into the vault, but Pulp takes these credentials typically when you configure a domain via the API. And it's just a pain point. I don't have a great answer right now, but this is definitely a pain point. So like we end up having to like get the credentials out of the vault and then hand them back through the API. I don't know, it's it's painful. Um, there's a bunch of ways to authenticate. Well, well, maybe not a bunch, but there's like at least a few. And that's been painful. Um, not all the plugins support domains. So like if someone walks up to us and says, hey, here's a pulp plugin, I want you to run it. You know, if it's not domain domainized, we can't run it. And that's a, that's a pain point. We also have multiple host names, like these are the gateways that I mentioned, so that are used to access our service. And so I filed this bug here, and this one I do hope that we will be able to fix. But the content origin, you know, Pulp takes a single content origin. When you have multiple web property host names bringing traffic in, one content origin doesn't work. So that's a pain point. Uh, we did have one unplanned outage. Um, the production settings were misconfigured. They were right for staging, but they weren't right for production. We uh, we didn't do the production push or we would have seen it right away, but an unexpected, our application can get deployed for reasons outside of our control, um, just like randomly in, in some cases for us. And so the push occurred not by us, but by some other third party. Um, and it occurred, like we basically weren't watching it at that moment when it pushed. And so the outage occurred and we got alerts and notifications and stuff like that. So the learning here is make sure you push to production anytime you're making non-code changes. Like if the application is the only thing that's upgrading, that's probably fine not to push immediately all the time. But if you're making like significant settings changes, you should definitely push to production right after you push to staging. And this is the, my last slide, which is the wins. Um, so it's great to have a large installation to evaluate new code with. Um, this has benefited us a lot. I mean, I really can't overstate how great that's been. Um, previously, as a developer, it's like, well, let me load up my test box, and am I loading it correctly? Well, now we have like this large installation around all the time that we can evaluate. Um, and we are able to deploy these test patches to the staging environment, and we test them for a few days. And then we move them to upstream pulp after we have some confidence. Um, the domain authorization has worked out really, really well for us. Again, that's the custom authorization stuff that we use. Um, domains as a feature is amazing. I mean, like 447 isolated pulp environments on this one installation. I really can't say enough good stuff about the domains feature set. Um, and then the RDS tooling has been super amazing. So um, that's the end of my content. Huge thanks to everybody who's worked on this installation. I don't think we have time for any questions. If someone has a burning question. No, we don't have time for questions. Thanks a whole what bunch, I was gonna everybody. What I'm going to suggest, Brian, before we start recording here, is uh, maybe throw a lightning talk down for anybody for with questions uh, for Pulp as a service. And that way, if folk have them, they can hop in at the end of the at the end of the UI talk, and you can answer them there. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds perfect. I'll be here. Perfect. All right. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.